Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, listeners. Today we have something totally different, and with almost 200 podcast episodes in the works, that's pretty unique. So with me today is Lynette and Lulu, and we are going to be talking about Lulu's book from client to clinician, and specifically on how they use neurofeedback for people with Alzheimer's. So thank you for joining me, ladies. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Appreciate it. You're welcome. So let's have Lulu introduce herself since she's the author, and then we'll have Lynette Tell us about herself. There we go. I can do it. (laughs) (laughs) Go for it, Lulu. (laughs) So, hi, I'm Lulu. I am a neurotherapist, and um, Lynette Louise is my mentor, and she's the one who has trained me in neurofeedback. My book, From Client to Clinician, is actually the story of me going from client of neurofeedback to a clinician of neurofeedback. Um, And in the book, I also tell the story of my brother who has autism and who Lynette uh, treated with neurofeedback as well as play therapy. And it's, that's the whole story of the book and what neurofeedback is. And there's interviews with uh, Dr. Lynette Louise. Um, So maybe just a little brief explanation of what neurofeedback is. Neurofeedback is a therapy. It's biofeedback for the brain, where we are improving brain functioning by training individuals how to control their own brainwave activity. And we use that through sensors that we place on the scalp. We measure the EEG, and then we use that to give feedback to the individual through positive reinforcements, reinforcements, sorry. Um, And they're just simple rewards, beeps, so auditory rewards and visual rewards. And it helps with many brain challenges, including Alzheimer's. So maybe Lynette, now you can go ahead and. <laughs> you want me to grab the ball? <laughs> with it? <laughs> All right. I'll pick up here. We, I said, just before we started, I said, we'll have to say here, like you do when you're on the court, right? <laughs> Mine. Okay. Mine. Um, all right. I'm Dr. Lynette Louise. I have a huge backstory. So my backstory is uh, condensing it that I adopted multiply challenged children. A lot of them had autism, fetal alcohol syndrome, and a variety of other things. As I tried to figure out how to help them, um, I had to actually solve problems that weren't solvable and learn things that hadn't been learned yet and combine therapies and create. And so that's how we ended up with a sort of a cocktail approach feedback, play therapy, and uh, family dynamics, counseling, all these things. And I traveled the world. It didn't stay just with any particular diagno- diagnosis. It ended up being whole family. So you, in a family, you'll have someone with Parkinson's, someone with Alzheimer's, someone with a trauma, uh, someone with autism, someone with ADHD. And it just grew. Fortunately, neurofeedback is a therapy for the brain. And all of these are brain disorders. It's not like a targeted medication where you have to be correctly aligned with the diagnosis. Rather, it's a therapy where you can target for the diagnosis and you can apply it to almost any challenge. So I always say a brain is a brain is a brain is a brain. And rather than worry about, gee, um, yeah, but does it work for this disorder? Well, it's about optimizing brain function. So if you're optimizing brain function, it really doesn't matter what your challenge is, you're going to improve. Are we going to cure your Alzheimer's or your autism? No, but you're going to improve in a way that um, depending on the, you know, the disorder, You're going to improve in a way that uh, changes your quality of life and possibly makes it look as if you've been healed. So um, that's kind of my backstory, my reason for being and how we ended up. I ended up working with uh, Lulua's family and Lulua and she became like the star pupil and the most amazing uh, (laughs) protege. 
And we've worked a lot since uh, those early days in Lebanon and in France. And, and yeah, no, it's really grown and she's really grown and I'm ready to take a back seat. Um, where Alzheimer's is, so, so that's the background and that's neurofeedback. I'll give it a more sort of a focus to Alzheimer's. And you had said at the beginning, Jen, do you want Jen or Jennifer? Either one's fine. Most people call me Jen. Okay, Jen. So you had said that usually you like to have sort of a, a caregiver story or, a, you know, a close in story. So I'll start with my mom since, uh, you know, it's always good to sort of feel what people are talking about, not just hear it with your brain, but hear it with your heart. Um, so my mom got dementia. Now, dementia is an umbrella term underneath which you have Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is more famous <laughs> for some reason, more people. And very often when someone has dementia, um, they have Alzheimer's or they have a different kind of dementia that doesn't fit into Alzheimer's itself. And Alzheimer's itself has various categories. So, um, where my mom considered, it was an interesting challenge. Because I what happened and they'd said, you know, you can't drive anymore. And I'd been the black sheep of the family. So I hadn't seen her in a long time. And I sat there with my siblings and I said, well, I can help her. This is what I do. But I don't live here and I live in a different country. And here's what I have. You guys have to agree. And here's what will happen. And so I'm sharing this now because it'll help you to understand this therapy. This is she's pretty far gone. I, you know, she didn't even recognize her husband in the other room. She went over and said, Lynn, who's that man in that room? <laughs> right. And yep, so it pretty typical. Right? Yeah. I have to treat her and then they have to do it weekly or biweekly or a few times a week, depending on her reaction. Um, and she's going to get better enough to be tricky again, to get away, maybe, to they'll have to, they had gone sort of with the degeneration to the point where we could put her somewhere or we could try to improve her enough to go back through that dangerous period. It's a tough call. And it was my siblings call to not help. It was really challenging for me to go, I have these tools and you're saying no. So I feel like I'm ah, <laughs> very sad to think of, but, and she's gone now. She passed uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, actually. Mm -hmm. but My mom did too. It was kind of a blessing. They didn't have to sit through all this pandemic stuff, right? Yeah, I've told um, most of my listeners know mom and I would go to the park or the pool or the library and we'd watch children. She watched children. I kind of just hung out. <laughs> but right? that's what we did. And that was not an option last year. And right. thankfully, she fell and broke her leg, which was the beginning of the end. Yeah, same up until us, then, it was a hit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So my mom always said everything works out for a reason. So I guess that was the reason for that one. Yeah, there you go. They didn't have to go through that being alone, even though you're kind of alone in your own head when you have Alzheimer's or dementia. But um, the the thing that the benefit for my clients in that was that I actually was very close and visited a lot and got some, some wonderful experiences because of it. Um, but I also got to see. What happens when I don't help? Mm -hmm. And I don't usually get to see that. Usually I'm called in to help, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't get to see what happens when I'm hands off. And it really reinforced for me that uh, people really should consider neurofeedback as a therapy for any brain challenge, really, but definitely something that's degenerative, like Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, dementia, those kinds of things. Um, it's the quality of life change and the speed of decline are so strongly affected. Well, I have a question. Lynette's in France, right? No, I am. Lynette is oh, in you California. Are. Oh, okay. Because, okay, well, that's I'm not interesting. Sure why she's cutting. <laughs> yeah, she, I thought she was the one that was in France, and that's why her internet's going, giving us a headache. 
But I had a, when you were telling your story, I can understand why your siblings chose not to go backwards in time with mom, because going back to that challenging time, that's a really hard time. And to have to go back into it, I'm not sure I'd choose that either. So that makes me question, obviously, my thought is, obviously, we should do this kind of treatment earlier to maybe slow down getting to that difficult stages, those difficult yes. stages. Yes, absolutely. But also, if you, it depends on the family, right? So it isn't like they would stayed in that place. We could have got enough improvements that she was in a better place than that really scary time. Um, but she'd have still, you know, she'd, she'd have still eventually lost the battle. And so it's a lot of work. It's a lot of heartache. Um, and I really advise, yes, more the early stages, much more. Which is one of the reasons we're talking today so that people learn about this and maybe they can participate before they get to the later stages like your mom and my mom. My mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years and until you guys reached out, I didn't even know that this was an option. So right. obviously it's something we need to let the world know about. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, and also, I mean, they have new stuff on this just happened. We've got a drug that just got approved that's hacking the, the amyloids. And I mean, it's pretty exciting. But even with that, there's not, you know, some of the people are responding, some aren't. And if you add neurofeedback at that point, when you'd be doing these things, oh my goodness, you'd, you'd be so well off. You'd, you're, you're, the clarity of thought and the improvement in your brain would be astronomically changed. So a lot of the people that I work with, they plateau and stay put, right? Backing up damage is harder, but we can kind of keep you in one place for a long time with Parkinson's, with dementia, all the different kinds of dementia, vascular, depending on what's going on with your heart. But um, yeah, no neurofeedback, unfortunately, and that's why it's so great that Lula has written her book and I've written books and we're talking to people. I mean, it's it's a field that because it's working with the whole brain and because it's non-intrusive, so it can apply to different things. Um, people intrusive, like electricity goes in or a medicine goes in or a, cer a cutting of the knife or a, and they want it to be that it's for only one thing or two things. Right. And when you're saying, no, it's a brain, it's a, we apply it to whatever is going on in the brain that is going on and behaving incorrectly, that is dysfunctional. And we teach the brain to operate more functionally. Um, this is hard for people to understand and to really believe in. They, they want it to sound much more like, um, well, it just sounds too good to be true. <laughs> That's the problem. That's true. Years and years ago, oh my this must have been in the 80s, which is making me show my age again. <laughs> I did biofeedback for like migraines, but it was not, it was just something you like an at home thing where you were kind of trained and you had like, I believe it was like a little four by six size. I don't even know what you want to call it. It wasn't a machine. It was the thing that made the noises. And then it had like Velcro loops that went around your fingers. And so my that's my like only experience with this kind of stuff and one night i did that i i did the biofeedback it's kind of like meditation i think it's like we're going way back here so i'm kind of scraping the rust off some of those brain cells but i remember waking up the next morning in the exact same position that i fell asleep in and i felt so much more rested which i am not a person that sleeps on my back so that was Amazing to wake up in that position and feel even better than had I'd slept normally. So I kind of think of neurofeedback, and you can correct me if I'm 100% wrong, is kind of like training your brain to work around whatever's going on. You want to take this one or shall I? <laughs> sure. I mean, yeah, it is. it is. I mean, it is a sort of biofeedback. It's just that we're speaking to 
the neurons directly. Um, and then what you're doing is you're just asking the brain to create more of certain frequencies and less of others. So depending on your challenge, you are asking for the brain to facilitate kind of new pathways and new ways of doing things. You're asking it, you're asking for a new direction, basically. You're saying, okay, you're used to doing this. Now, how about you try to do that other thing that you're not used to doing? That makes sense. I liked your comparison to meditation because when you learn to meditate, what do you do? You learn to focus in on something or open focus, however you're doing it. You learn to uh, get your breathing happening. So you change your brain and your body. You change your oxygen flow. You change how your brain's operating, what you're thinking about, what you're focusing on. Um, this is much more powerful in that we can look at these minute changes in the brain. But the idea is the same. It's not that different. And we still have those small things that you use, those portable devices. And we have more sophisticated ones now. Sounds like you were working with uh, either temperature or blood flow or oxygenation if it was on your fingers. Yeah, I don't think it was fancy enough for oxygenation. Because I think it was just well, like, how do you do I think it was you um, nerve. What was it? It had to be like blood pressure or something that could be read through like a Velcro loop on your finger. How do you do an oxygen test when you go to the hospital to see how much oxygen you have? You stick your finger in this little thing. Oh, that's true. Fortunately, I don't have that experience too much. <laughs> But I can use my Apple Watch. <laughs> <laughs> yes, much fancier now. <laughs> well, and, you know, I'm old enough when we got our first Apple IIe computer, which was in 1982. <clears throat> I was in high school. I think my Apple Watch has more memory and more computing power than that computer did. It just blows my mind. But I wanted to take a quick step back because you were saying you mentioned that the 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 new treatment drug which i cannot pronounce so i'm not going to try has been approved they've got to do another clinical study which it's kind of like approved with um caveat yeah conditions that's a good better word but i had ju i just read last night or this morning that hopefully now that there is a potential treatment people will get tested sooner cuz i've talked to a lot of people that are like there's no cure. Why should I bother knowing? And you guys probably aren't aware that my mom had Alzheimer's. Her mom had vascular dementia. And my maternal great grandmother had some sort of dementia. She died before I was born, which obviously we have detailed was like in the 60s. So <laughs> the late 60s. Thank you. And, you know, so I don't know. I don't know if they knew what type it was at that point. But it runs in my family and, you know, there's times when it's like, yeah, I'd like to know so that I can take care of things beforehand, you know, if I'm at a higher risk, which I just always assume I am. But now that there's a potential therapeutic is the right word, more people might get earlier testing and then we can do all these lifestyle changes, neurofeedback, maybe use this medication, right. or whatever else they come up with in the next year or two. So it's... Even right, if it right. even if it doesn't work, because I guess there's a question as to whether or not it actually works, which is kind of interesting that they'd approve it anyway. Well, I think that's about significant. So when you do a study, you have to have like a certain level of response for and they got that in one study, not in the other. And so there's that whole depending on dosage and stuff still being figured out. But it's definitely working well enough for this level of approval, I think. I agree. So, Lulu, you went from being a client to a clinician. You want to talk about that journey a little bit real quick? Since you've been so quiet and your internet connection is better from <laughs> France than Lynette's from my state. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I can, I, I, it is a topic, Alzheimer's dementia, it's not something that I'm personally uh, familiar with. So, if, and I know I most probably am going to be in close contact with someone. So I just love learning and hearing about both of your stories. Um, but yeah, my story is, is 
because of my brother, he had to, he was offered neurofeedback and he did great with it in terms of um, his sensory issues. Even he was a bit violent, he was very violent, um, his communication. And then I ended up doing it myself for my depressive tendencies, my lack of focus. So neurofeedback is a great tool also for, I can imagine families who are dealing with someone who has dementia, Alzheimer's, you know, whatever you are feeling or going through, it's also a tool that you can and should use for, for yourself. You know, if you're, if you're not feeling well enough to care for someone else, then that, that won't help either. So it's definitely a great tool for the family. And that's why then I was saying that it's a great family solution. Um, and so then I ended up finding it so fascinating that I wanted to work in it and, uh, I got trained and yeah, I do have, I think it's very important for everyone who is interested in getting trained in neurofeedback. You must have your own personal experience with it to really understand what neurofeedback is and what it can do. Um, and really just to, sorry, I'm going to bring it back to Lynette because that is my main question that people ask me and that I wonder myself. So for a neurodegenerative disease like that, how, how are symptoms, how are you, how can neurofeedback, that's coming from someone who's supposed to know this, but I'm, I really <laughs> am wondering, because I know that's what everyone else is asking, how, how is it able to really pause and the symptoms and how is it helping and not get worse? It's, okay, it, it, so how's my connection? Because this is a good question. Hopefully yeah, it's good it's now. Good. <laughs> okay. um, interrupt me if it's not, and I can always return and circle back. So there's a couple of answers here. One is Alzheimer's itself. You know, what are some of the preventatives? Um, what are the main preventatives for Alzheimer's to at least put it off into the distant time so the onset is later is a to have a variety of learning so when they uh, when they examine people and they look at you know what's been the lifestyle that led up to Alzheimer's or not or when they see after an autopsy gee this person had tons of plaques and tangles and and operated fine and then they examine what was the difference um the difference tends to be having a variety of learning, having not just be a person who's great in one thing in their field, but is in fact insatiably interested in, in always learning new things and very varied and eclectic and active, you know, active with their brain, active with their body. So when you do neurofeedback, one of the things you do and is you ask the brain to shift how it's operating. When you learn something new, one of the things you do is ask the brain to shift how it's operating. So if I decide I want to learn a new language, well, you can think about, gee, I'm going to study it, but what's happening in your brain? What's, what's going on? Well, new things are being wired in new ways of operating are happening. And that's what neurofeedback does. It asks your brain to shift. So even as a preventative, like for you who have it in the family, Jen, as a preventative, just doing neurofeedback in a varied way with lots of different sites and lots of different actions happening in your brain because of that, you're going to improve your odds of being one of those people who maybe has it and nobody knows. <laughs> I'll go and for that. And that happened. <laughs> right? So that's that's part of the reason that you would be able to sort of plateau somebody because you're first of all, you're helping prevent the degeneration by keeping that brain active and learning, but also you're optimizing areas. So let's use an example that's easy to understand. My connection's still okay. Okay. So here's, a, here's a, a, an easier way to understand it. When somebody has dementia or Alzheimer's, one of the things you'll see them start doing, they'll be pretty good while they chat with you. But if you ask them memory questions or, you know, where did you put your pen just now? Something recent, something close in, they're going to have a harder time. But another thing that they'll do is they'll start using that. Can you give me that? thing in a jig with the 
square white over there and it's their phone right or you know what i mean like it's something they can't find the words they can't bring it together and they're using alternate ways of expressing it well they're sort of self helping they're going okay i can't get the word i need so i'm going to grab something else i want to say sofa i can't get that word i'm going to say couch or i'm going to say uh the sit on her <laughs> right well, that's them using their brain to find an alternative pathway to get to the end result they're after. With neurofeedback, we're sort of tuning up the brain and helping alternative pathways that are less effective be more effective so that then they can come up with maybe instead of sit on her, they can say couch, right? And that wouldn't even have been noticed. So there's a lot of answer to your question, Lula, but that's a large part of it, especially when it's related to this um, disorder that's all about sort of short-term memory and maintaining the long-term potentiation, but not the short-term stuff. And, uh, you know, this whole issue of not being able to try something new because now you're afraid, right? You've become afraid, you know you're not working well, you're pulling away, you're not wanting to be social because someone will notice, you're getting afraid to try new things because you're having so much trouble with old things. So it doesn't occur to you to try to break through that by learning new things. Mm. I don't even ask you to, I just stick the sensor on your head and tell your brain <laughs> what to do. <laughs> So those are some answers to a very actually challenging question that I could probably do an hour on. <laughs> which i've i've gone down that road with the super long episodes i do know that people with like a higher level of intelligence which is not to say that some of us are you know dumb it's it's just higher than average intelligence sometimes can mask the early symptoms easier because they have more coping techniques in their brain yeah. more more pathways, more pathways. Is, yeah is probably the right term and then so somebody that's really intelligent or, you know, like genius level IQ type person, just somebody that's got like a lot of education, they might go along really fine into the first, second, maybe even, you know, entering the third stage. And all of a sudden they run out of these pathways, these coping techniques. And all of a sudden it looks like they've gone from zero to, you know, five out of a scale from one to ten overnight. And it's not really overnight. It's, or at least they don't think so. They just think that they've run out of these pathways. So it makes okay. sense that we need to grow those pathways in right. multiple and ways. And, yes, strengthen them and wire them differently. So get it, basically, it's like doing construction in the brain and getting around the plaques and tangles, right? And making new connections and new ways to do things. I'd like to to say something to what you just said, though. It's a scary part of Alzheimer's is that the higher IQ, higher functioning person can uh, hide it a little better. And so there you have maybe a doctor, for example, who is getting Alzheimer's. And part of, unfortunately, part of it, the whole umbrella of dementia is that you don't really recognize your own deficit at the degree that you have it. And you don't want to admit to it. And the more you are high functioning, the more you don't want to admit to it. And so now you have someone who doesn't really remember what exactly they should be giving you as a prescription. And they're, you see what I'm saying? So we need to destigmatize all of this and really make it possible for people to say, hey, you know, I'm having some memory issues. I think I'm going to do some memory games. I'm going to look into some mem memory vitamins because all these things exist, right? Uh, learn a new thing, get my brain going, maybe do some neurofeedback, oxygenate more, get a little more active. There's All these things help and they really help. So um, if we were afraid to say it out loud, we'd get the support of our family when we needed to change all that. Definitely. And you said your mom is gone. My, and I said, my mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years. She passed away shortly after her 77th birthday. If we had been able to push out the onset of her disease 10 years, you know, maybe she would have lived to 87. I was just telling my husband today, it bothers me a lot. Today would have been my dad's 80th birthday. 
he didn't make it to 78 either. So mm. it's like, um, I don't think he made it to 77 because I can't do math, but that's okay. <laughs> that's not a new problem. So but, you should try to learn math because that's a challenge for you. And it would be wiring your brain differently. I learned how to turn. I used to. I, I until last year I was a professional photographer and I have learned how to turn a podcast into a business, which is a lot harder than I thought. And so I, th I think I've done okay. Just, just talk about learning math makes me want to scream. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It does me too, but you know what? That math is mostly done in the parietal lobes in the back of the brain. And, um, a lot, of, a lot of dementia and Alzheimer's is related to the occipital lobe, which is in the back of the brain. So the fact that you hate math might be an indicator that you should play with some math. Now you can make uh, math, right? It could be a math game. I it could try. Play more I've cards. Hmm. I could do cards. I've never played bridge, but I could probably learn. I think my husband might know how to play that. I don't know, I have to ask. I know his grandmother's played cribbage, so... But I've learned new games. I've learned, and you know, I I exercise. I eat right. I take a specific supplement called Relevate. It's got seventeen yep. things, yeah, nutrients for your brain. What else do I do? I'm trying to learn new stuff. It's usually on the creative side because that's me. But still learning new stuff all the time. What else do I do? Get good sleep. Try to stay positive. That one's been challenging the last year. Yeah, no. We're waiting desperately for the tomatoes to greet or to ripen on the plant. I love home, you know, grown tomatoes. The zucchinis, we have decided we're not ever planting two zucchini plants again. <laughs> it's like zucchini three times a day. <laughs> but um, my husband just recently had a health scare. He had um, blood clots in his lungs. And in dealing with that, they're like, Dude, we think you're pre-diabetic, which was a, my dad was diabetic. So I'm like, yeah, that's not a surprise to me, honey. So in reading what he should and shouldn't eat, you know, to improve on, they don't know if he is, they got to do some more tests, but assuming that he is, then, you know, we're like, we're, we've been going back to the healthy, healthier lifestyle we had when we lost a lot of weight, getting back there. So it's all, it's all okay process <laughs> it's like it's i don't know i should have the healthiest of... brain on the planet <laughs> not if you're avoiding your math <laughs> well i can do i'm teasing you i know I'm well, I can do... teasing you. well i always tease my husband he says well you're no good at math i'm like put a dollar sign in front of it and i'm like that because i <laughs> i can figure out especially if it's x plus y dollar sign is what you owe me I come up with an exact <laughs> number. So there are priorities with my math skills. Actually, know. that's usually how I teach math with autism is with um, money because money is math. But it's it's I am teasing you. Um, I think, though, that we're always walking that fine line between I don't want to create stress in my life by trying to do the things that are so horrible for me and that I don't enjoy. Um, I also, though, don't want to avoid it to the point where everybody else sort of takes it over for me, you know, does the mm. scoring so that I don't have to do the math does, you know, and before you know it, they're all saying, well, you don't like math. So we'll do your math. And, um, and that part of the brain now atrophies a little bit and sense. doesn't do its job. So it's kind of this balance between, yes, I don't like doing that. I don't want to be that person, but I also don't want to be crippled. And keep so you know keep buying things and you'll be fine <laughs> <laughs> okay well i've got like a wish list on a website for my hobby and i will add it up in my head so that i can see how much i'm going to spend before i hit buy <laughs> there you go i could do there that yeah i have the same problem i hate math so i started really um paying attention to what i was spending in the grocery store because that was immensely really challenging and I got really good at it. And I thought, well, I must have fixed something. <laughs> right. So hopefully you start spending less. <laughs> probably. It probably I did heard, do that as well. I heard this is a side note and it's just it's funny. So I'm gonna mention it. You know, we've got a significant part of our country that doesn't want to teach critical race theory 
on the auspice that it makes people uncomfortable. And I was listening to a podcast and the two gals on the podcast, one of them said, well, chemistry made me feel horrible, so we shouldn't teach chemistry. <laughs> and the other gal, I, th- I think the other gal mentioned math, but I'm I'm in my office listening to that going, yeah, they should stop teaching math because, man, that just really wrecked my life. <laughs> So, yes, it's not it's not exactly a, a winning argument there, but, you know, oh, I like it's, what- and, and it's really awful that we think that we should be happy and comfortable all the time. That it's is true. one of our ills. Mm-hmm. You know, it leads to all kinds of antidepressant medication. And I'll go, no, you're supposed to get sad. You're supposed to get stressed. You're supposed to struggle and you're supposed to learn how to get through it. Like we did and last like it, year. Uh, kind of no really oh, last this year was is... like let's do all of the coping techniques all at one time <laughs> right <laughs> well a lot we moved which you know is one of the top five stressors my mom was getting she was already very combative and she was becoming more yeah. of a challenge and then she fell and she ended up in the hospital and it was like wait a minute this this virus thing seems to be not just in china like do I want to be in the hospital anywhere near anybody? Do I want her? It's like, so there was all that. So that was uh, uh, March 8th. And so I saw her the 8th, 12th, 14th, and 16th. March 16th is when the governor of California closed all the counties in the San Francisco Bay Area, of which I am one. And so I didn't get to see my mom the last two weeks of her life. And that was very stressful because I wasn't aware that she was actually in the active stages of dying because I didn't see it. I did see her before she died, the day before, so that was okay. But I was very concerned that she would forget that I was her, quote, best friend, and that when I saw her again, she would not trust me and all of the combative problems that she was presenting us would be 10 times worse. So there was that. Mm -hmm. Then she dies, and it was like I had to deal with my sister. My sister and I don't see anything the same. So there was that. So that was, okay, so that was March 31st. And then now we're on shutdown. And then everything gets canceled. And then, you know, it's like, we all know what happened last year. In November, my oldest dog died. And then this past April, my paternal grandmother passed away at 103, which was less sad, but it's just continually yeah. one end of an era after another. And then right after my grandmother, my husband ends up in the hospital. It's like, okay, people, done. <laughs> I'm ready for the uh, feel good for a while part of the right. life, <laughs> but I you learned know. a lot of coping techniques. So that was a positive. And we had a quiet, you know, quiet time at home for you to go through all that. And it probably was less, less pull on you in many ways, except for the moving part. But <laughs> yeah, we didn't you know. Well. I, I kind of, I liked the pandemic as much as I hate that people suffered and all that. I felt like in our world, it was a chance to go, all right, stop, let's hang yeah. out, right? Well, I've worked at home for 16 years, so it not very much in my life changed. I've used Zoom since September of 2018. Everything went on Zoom, so that was good and bad, mostly good, but, you know, there are days when it's like, oh, my God, another Zoom call, <laughs> you know, and, the, and I'm hoping that as a society that we've learned you know, working from home is product can be productive. And there's a lot of ancillary benefits. Like, you know, you can pick up the kids from school and then come back and go back right. to work. You right. can take the dog for a walk and maybe right. do a, a a conference call, you know, with your AirPods. We're not polluting the earth with driving. We're less stress. I mean, I'm just hoping, hoping that we've learned a lot. And you know, unfortunately, on the flip side of the coin, And I was a huge advocate against all of the older adults, like my mom being locked away from family. Like my mom would not have coped with a window visit because her visual processing was so bad. She would have no flipping clue who she was looking at. She didn't even know who I was as it was. And if she didn't recognize this person as her friend, then that would be a problem. But she also recognized me as the- wouldn't it? It's just- (sighs) Yeah, it would it's be just, creepy. You don't recognize the person and they're standing there staring at you yeah, through the window. And it's, it's like some kind of like, horror movie. Yeah. Well, no, then it, be- it just, you know, and I kept saying, you know, we're protecting them from this virus, but we're killing them from isolation. And I mean, it was really easy for me to say because I wasn't having to deal with my mom. But, you know, I could see 
the damage that it was causing the people living with the dementias of of whatever form they've got mm-hmm. and the caregivers their family that were taking care of it was just it was it was worse than a train wreck but you know hopefully we've learned and now we can see that you know we've got this new drug we're talking about your neurofeedback so i'm i'm hopeful that we just keep moving forward and learning new things which is right. good for our brains right and don't wait. Don't wait for, you know, you don't wait for the drug and the diagnosis. You go, you know, it's in my family. How do I, what are the things I do to offset the possibilities? Why wait? You know, you're feeling a little depressed. That's part of it. Maybe you're getting it a little bit. Who cares? We don't need to know. We don't need to know before we make the changes. And the changes may make the changes so that you don't need to know. Right. So it's really important not to sit back and wait and hide it. I I think the stigma is the biggest part, really. Um, Even with this new medication, you would want something that's helping keep you optimized, not just attack those plaques and tangles, because you're also getting old. (laughs) (laughs) Stuff's still happening, right? Stuff's still happening. That's what I tell people. My paternal grandmother lived to be 103. That makes me have 49 more years to go. There you go. It's a whole life. And I plan on making sure that I can use, I can enjoy all of those 49 years or at least 48 and a half. I find a a lot of similarity between, I'm trying to throw the ball back to Lulu up. And I think something to know is that, that I, a lot of the things that I understand about Alzheimer's, I got that knowledge from working with autism. There's a lot of sameness here. It being a, it can be a whole brain disorder. It affects it very radically. It um, also can, you know, can deal in one area of the brain where you just worry about this one area of the brain. It presents very differently in a lot of people until the later stages, and depending on the type you have, but also just in how they respond. There's, uh, you've probably seen it. How to talk to someone with Alzheimer's or how to talk to someone with dementia. Well, it's also how to talk to someone with autism, right? You don't challenge the world they live in, you don't, all that stuff. And so when I was working with autism a lot and then I got my first Alzheimer's patient, I went, well, this is so similar. And many of the things that had worked well for me with autism worked well in Alzheimer's. So I think that you should take the, a minute um, to talk about your brother and about sort of you've done neurofeedback on him as well. And what you see as what's changed in his ability to remember and cope, Mm. especially the anger thing, because that is a very big part of Alzheimer's. As you move along, Mm -hmm. they get very cantankerous, cantankerous, they get very sort of paranoid and, and, uh, and they hit you and stuff too. So much like your brother was. Yeah. So it was really with the neurofeedback, it was a mix of helping his brain, like we were explaining, have new ways of, of coping with what was going on around him. We also had to learn how to be around him. So like you were saying, um, we had to understand if he was going through this, we shouldn't, you know, ask him to do certain things if he's, you know, in the middle of a tantrum and, and just help him through it and support it. But really the neurofeedback was here to calm him in times where maybe his sensory, you know, maybe things were happening around him or he was trying to get things out of us and we were understanding of it. Um, And just calming him overall, that was the real issue that my parents were first dealing with. Once that was kind of out of the way, we were able to kind of pinpoint and go in with his communication, go in with how is he understanding socially the people around him? How is he understanding his life? What kind of independence he wants to have? What kind of freedom he's looking for? Um, And I guess that's where you would see similarities too, where if, if we are just trying to control this person because we're so scared of what they may do next, we are removing any kind of freedom and independence they may have. And I think as a family, just knowing that there was a tool that we had to help us all through it, because it's 
it's not a lonely he's not just going through it alone in the same way with Alzheimer's and dementia. It's a whole family thing. So with us, it was, and that's why I love neurofeedback so much is it's a tool. It's here for you. It's here to help you speed up whatever you're trying to work with. So it's not, you're not alone doing this. You're here helping their brain and telling them, okay, how about we try to work on this area of your brain while at the same time, we're giving you more, chances to try this and this and this or to like your example before to ask for that object um maybe okay we're saying he wants the remote maybe with neurofeedback will help with figuring out whether it's a focus and clarity issue or it's a language issue or whatever it is um the two things working together is really just a beautiful thing to have and knowing that we're we are well supported um that i mean it is a it is a commitment you know you don't just do a session and and then just never do it again you can and you you should feel different after a session but it is more of a long-term thing um and really what i love the most about it is that you are changing the brain you really are so, and Lynette says all the time, it's, it's, you don't know what would have happened if you hadn't done a session. Very you, true. You, you really don't know. So it's, and that's where it gets tricky where it's like, did it actually help? Did it not actually help? Because you, you did a session. So now it's a, it's a new landscape. It's a new setting that you're dealing with. Um, and that's why I can imagine using it as a preventative tool can be really powerful. Yeah, and no, it's, it's it's really good actually. That was nice, very nice. <laughs> so he, <laughs> he's my star. <laughs> well, I've I've noticed lots of similarities between autism and Alzheimer's, especially later stage Alzheimer's and those that are I don't I don't have the right terminology for people that I mean I've like my nephew is on the autism spectrum. But he is 100% different than the client that I had who is autistic. He was verbal, but it didn't take a lot for him to get overstimulated. And I had to work with him differently than I had to work with his twin sister. And it was a great learning experience because obviously he wasn't the only person with autism in my world. So I appreciated that learning experience and my mom was already in the later stages of Alzheimer's. So there was definitely a connection, but was your brother or is he still nonverbal? No, he's, he's verbal now. He's the biggest blogger I know actually. He's bilingual. (laughs) He's making up for lost time. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) But yes, he was nonverbal at first. That's interesting. This is really fascinating. I'm so glad yeah. you guys reached out to me because, you know, like I said, as we started, I had no idea. I didn't know very much about neurofeedback and I had no idea that it could help people at any stage of Alzheimer's, but it's definitely something we should keep in our tool chest for, you know, like people like me should consider it, even though I'm doing everything else except for the math. <laughs> Yeah, and there's there so many providers now. Um, it, it shouldn't be that difficult to find. Uh, I might have to around. might have to check in with my healthcare provider. I try to avoid those people. <laughs> try to keep myself healthy. But oh, gee, you know, there's always just a good old Google search. See who's around and what they're doing. Yeah. Um, I want to just. I know we're getting close to the end and I always like to think, you know, gee, we've told all these people about neurofeedback, but if they don't have it, what can they do themselves right now? What kind of gold can we give them so that when they stop listening, they go, wow, I got something and I can use it right now. <laughs> so, That's excellent. Um, so what I'd like to talk about just for a second is stress and show you how that affects your memory in a very clear way. So let's say you're somebody who is um, 
wondering about their memory. Like I'm losing things. I can't remember where I put anything. And I, I don't know how to think backwards anymore. Somebody says to me, okay, where were you when you walked in the door? Which way did you go? Because that's how we always figure out where our things are. And, and there's, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. If you're feeling worried, never mind whether you have Alzheimer's or not, whether, never mind if you have autism. If you're feeling worried and preoccupied and there are things happening in the environment that you walk into that will interrupt your rote and natural habitual behavior, you will put things places without knowing where you put them. You will walk places without knowing where you walked. It's like getting out of your car while you're on the phone and not paying attention to where you parked and then you can't find it later. It's not because your memory is going though it may be, it's because you're doing preoccupation. You're doing stress. You're doing inner attention, not outer attention. And you can't remember something you never learned in the first place. So if you never saw yourself put it somewhere, you can't remember where that is. So this becomes really important once you have a brain challenge. Because that can optimize a lot and take a lot of the difficulty down and bring you back to an operating level that's better, like by years, simply by going, okay, I'm going to pay attention. And you don't need neurofeedback for that tip. <laughs> that reminds me of a, yeah, really. It reminds <laughs> me of a story when I was in college so i was probably 18 19 at the oldest my college was not far from the local shopping mall those things we used to have in the 80s that were cool that are dying at this point <laughs> and i went to the mall for something parked my car on say the east side went back to class and i think i went and picked something up i basically went to the mall twice in one afternoon and the second time i parked on the west side and I went in and did whatever I needed to do and then exited on the east and was literally seconds away from calling the cops because I thought somebody stole my car because I couldn't find it anywhere. When thankfully that brain cell popped to life and went, wait a minute, that was earlier today. Your car is way over there. But <laughs> I remember that we're talking uh, like 35 years ago or maybe a little more. And I remember how like horrifyingly scary that was i mean mostly because i thought my car had been stolen and why anybody would want a 1982 ford escort i didn't know because those weren't great cars but i can imagine what it's like for somebody in the early stages before they even know they're having memory issues to have those kind of panic moments all the time and i don't really want to tell people that you went to the mall twice and you lost your car because that's just really <laughs> embarrassing but also like when you park your car the vision is different. So when you're walking into the store, you're going, say, east. And when you're coming out, the whole the whole landscape looks different. And so don't, you know, like you said, pay attention. But Take a minute and say, okay, I'm struggling lately. So I'm going to fix that by putting more, you know, very specific information in. Okay, I'm walking towards a store. That landmark's there. You know, I'm walking facing the sign that says pharmacy. I'm like, really take a minute. Don't be on your phone or busy in your head because you won't know, you won't know where you were and you'll, and you'll get scared. And then that'll become a feedback loop that makes it worse. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and if you're paying attention as you're entering the store too, maybe you'll, if you're intentionally paying attention to the external input, maybe you'll notice that you're walking in front of this car that's patiently waiting for you. I hate going by the grocery store. People always walk diagonally. Right? And I don't think they realize it takes three times as long. And it's just one of those things where I have a hybrid and it's like, okay, the electric engine is running right now. I could just poop, run right over you and you'd never even know it was coming because you're not paying attention and it's car is not making any noise. So it's just one of my little frustrations that I, I have to just breathe. It's like, it's okay. Extra 10 or 15 seconds isn't going to kill me. It's just right. Yeah, I try to avoid the grocery store at certain times of day so that I don't have that issue. But, you know, I feel like there's so much input these days that we just we have like no clue. It's like people just stop and smell the roses, you know, yeah. look around. Yeah, you know, the, 
Make Might be money. some pretty flowers outside the grocery store or some kid doing something funny. You never know what you're missing because you're living inside your head or on your phone or both. Don't do that. Pay attention to the world around you. It's right. not that bad a that's place. A, that's a nice point to make at the end. That's Thank lovely. you. <laughs> so can we get your book from client to clinician? Is that available on Amazon? Yes, it is on Amazon. It's like, isn't everything? I will make sure... <laughs> I will make sure that it is linked in the show notes so people can learn more about your story and how Thank you. neurofeedback was such a positive experience for your family and your brother that you would then became a clinician of neuro, neuro uh, neurofeedback. There we go. And yeah, I just hope uh, it can help other families too. I think this is, I'm so glad we had this conversation. Cause like I said, I've done almost 200 episodes and, I have never talked to anybody about this particular subject, so definitely was a necessity. So I really appreciate that you guys reached out to me and that we could make this work today with Lulu in France and Lynette is on the other end of California, I believe. Yep. With- <laughs> thank you for having us. It was really a pleasure. You're yes, welcome. Thank you for sharing your audience. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.